Hey guys, I'm Chris Black and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks and this week we're taking a look at one of the most influential and widely heard delays of all time. Yep, yeah, a name that still manages to fly under the radar. We are of course talking about the Binson Echo Rack. <laughs> on if you can drop an image of a vintage delay unit in your mind's eye it'll closely resemble the maestro echoplex after all it's one of the most ubiquitous delays of all time it's been used by everyone from Jimi hendrix to eddie van halen to eric johnson to john martin you name them they've probably used an echoplex it's also one of the most widely recreated delay sounds of all time with any number of companies having taken on the frankly unenviable task of trying to recreate that distinctive wow and flutter that's so synonymous not only with the sound of the echoplex but popular music in general throughout the 1960s and 70s. Yep, yeah, there was another name in the delay game, one that, though considerably less famous, arguably reached just as many years as the echoplex, having been at the very heart of one of the biggest selling albums of all time. The album, Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, and the delay, The Binson Echo Rack. Now, the Echo Rack was the brainchild of Italian inventor Dr. Bonfiglio Bini, who had a history of audio entrepreneurship. He'd been making valve radios since World War II and would eventually start making guitar amplifiers. However, with his principal engineer, Scarano Gitano, it was to be 1955 that he would finally make history with the introduction of the Binson Echo Rack. Now, the idea behind the Echo Rack was to make a delay that was fundamentally more stable or more durable than the plastic magnetic tape that was fast becoming the industry standard for delay and unlike the maestro echoplex which was another six years away at this point is worth saying the key component in the echo rack was a steel disc shaped drum driven by an ac motor via a rubber jockey wheel running around the outside of the drum was an aluminium thread ring and around the outside of the aluminium thread ring was a length of 100 super fine stainless steel recording wires each about 0.1 millimeter in diameter it's roughly the width of a human hair for context the playback and record heads were arranged around the circumference of the drum which crucially picked up varying delay times first was the record head followed by the playback heads which gave four different rhythmic tap settings it took 74 seconds for the signal to reach the first playback head, thus resulting in a 74 millisecond delay. The second head was at 148 milliseconds, the third at 222, and the fourth at 296. And much like every other decision made in the design of the Echo Rack, the ratio spacing between the heads was a fundamentally musical decision. 
first tap, resulting in a 16th note, the second an eighth, the third a dotted eighth, and the fourth a quarter note. There was no control for the delay time as the distance between each head was set, but as you can imagine, very speed was an incredibly common modification over the years to control the drum's rate of rotation. And you can see such a modification on this incredible example of an echo rack loaned to me very kindly before today's video by Mr. Adrian Thorpe of Thorpey Effects. This is what it sounds like. Needless to say, with its innovative design and incredibly distinctive sound, the echo rack was quick to catch on, with Hank Marvin being one particularly notable early adopter. Hawkwind were big fans, as were Led Zeppelin, it would turn out, and not just Jimmy Page. Producer Andy Johns put an echo rack to incredible use on John Bonham's drum track on When the Levee Breaks. That distinctive, reflective gagak that you can hear so clearly on his drums, in particular at the start of the song, was courtesy of an echo rack. However, ultimately it would prove to be Pink Floyd that would become most synonymous with the sound and look of an echo rack, both during Sid Barrett's time with the band and David Gilmour's. Now you can actually see two echo racks incredibly clearly in the studio footage from 1967, both atop Richard Wright's keys and atop Sid Barrett's guitar amp. But when David Gilmour took over in 1968, he was to continue principally with Sid Barrett's guitar setup. And throughout the 1970s, the echo rack was all over pretty much everything Pink Floyd released. From that distinctive rhythmic bounce on Roger Waters' bass track on one of these days, that eerie drone in parts of Echoes, and probably most famously, David Gilmour's guitar solo on time. It's also literally all over the live at Pompeii set in 1970. 
1972. Ultimately, David Gilmour was to grow tired of the constant maintenance involved in keeping several Echo Racks roadworthy, and in time for the Animals Tour in 1977 was to change over to a rack-mounted MXR Digital Delay, a switch which ultimately was to prove indicative of change in trends, because in 1981, after 26 years of production, Binson would finally cease to make the Echo Rack. Needless to say, I mean, all been handmade in a small factory in Milan. Original units in great condition are few and far between, and if you do find one, expect to pay upwards of five, six thousand pounds to get your hands on it. Thankfully, there are any number of incredible digital modern reinterpretations of that Echo Rack sound. Catlin Bread being the first to put their stamp on the Echo Rack in 2012, a pedal I bought on the day of its release, actually, having been a big fan of the Echo Rack sound for a long time. Strymon entered the fray in 2019 with the Volante. However, my personal favourite has got to be the Dawn of Prince Buna. Had the seal of approval from the likes of John Mayer and, of course, David Gilmore himself. And I can hear that pedal in this next clip, taken from an interview I did with Guitarist Magazine back in 2019. And lastly, we've got the Buna, um, Dawn of Prince Buna Echo Rec kind of thing. That tends to get used uh, for a couple of specific parts in the Buck and Evans set. Uh, most notably, I guess, this is an instrumental bit um, in the middle of a track called Slow Train, which uh, sounds a little bit like this. So we've got... Ultimately, it may be the Maestro Echoplex, which is probably on the tip of most guitarists' tongues when it comes to vintage delay units. As I said, it's been pretty ubiquitous over the years, and the fact that any number of pedal companies strive to recreate not only its delay sound, but of course its revered preamp, just keeps the legend alive. However, it's testament to the sonic and design innovation of the Binson Echo Rack that some 67 years after its release, companies are still striving to capture its magic, its vibe, and its sound. None more so than the Pulsar Audio Echo Rack plugin, which I'm going to be using on the outro of this clip, using the Iverson Guitars Dakota. As ever, though, thank you very much for watching. I'm Chris Buck. You've been watching Friday Fretworks. Please subscribe, hit the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for another episode. Cheers, guys. Take care. I'll see you soon.